staying power. He's Timmy got to Smith. go over 200 yards. Timmy Smith, you're talking about a one-game wonder. I remember seeing him again uh, after that season. Everybody still requests me to do the shuffle. Hey, man, let me see the shuffle. I kind of look at him. Man, I'm, uh, I'm 40 now. I don't do the shuffle no more, dude. NFL history is filled with stars who shined over a long period of time. They are the legends of the game. 180! But through the years, other players have had their 15 minutes of fame, shooting stars who were great for just one season, one game, or even just one play. Being a hero is not necessarily a permanent condition. A person can rise to the occasion for one moment and become a hero. Mike Jones tackled Dyson. Here's O'Donnell, big blitz. And he fires a pass, and it's pulled in and intercepted at the 40. Larry Brown with a big interception. All of a sudden, people think that that represents what he's capable of doing on a bigger scale, and it doesn't. It represents what it was. I mean, you fall in love with a chapter, and you assume that that's going to be the book, and it's not. The number 10 one-shot wonder of all time, Mike Jones. To me, Super Bowl heroes should have regal names. Lynn Swan. Terrell Davis. Davis with the salute. And then, there's Mike Jones. You know Mike Jones. I know Mike Jones. One of the most common names in the English language and one of the greatest plays in Super Bowl history. Mike Jones tackled Dyson at the one yard line as time ran out. That is the first time in the history of the National Football League that a Super Bowl literally came down to 18 inches. I mean, Mike Jones personifies one hit wonder. Forget about one good year, he had one big play. Our number 10 one-shot wonder is famous for stopping Kevin Dyson on the one inch line to win Super Bowl 34. One play in an 11 year career. Before the Rams, Mike Jones was an average linebacker for the Silver and Black. After the Rams let him go, he was a run of the mill linebacker for the Black and Gold. I could give you probably 1,600 bios off the top of my head in the National Football League right now, which I'd be pretty proud of, and Mike Jones wouldn't be one of them. Mike Jones was one of those linebackers that doesn't make a ton of big plays. Um, he actually went to the Rams and for a good portion of his career was a special teams player. Worked his way into the regular defense. Jones was a cog in the machine no one noticed, especially in the greatest show on turf. Torrey Holtz got it and the Rams have another touchdown. But he wasn't anonymous among his coaches and teammates. To them, he played a critical role on the squad. Mike Jones was important to the team beyond that one play. And we brought him in there as a free agent from the Raiders because Mike White had coached him at the Raiders and thought his leadership and his contribution to the defense plus his growth as a player was all in front of him. MJ, the steadying influence, the co he is the captain. He's the guy that's always going to come in the same. He's going to work hard every day, be where he's supposed to be. Three years in a row, he's been voted as the inspirational leader of the defensive football team. He's just one of those kind of guys. Thank you, buddy. All right, now we got one more step. One tremendous, more step. Tremendous leadership. One more step here. First and goal to go. Our number 10 one-shot wonder made the big play because he did just as he was told. All right, guys. Last play of the game. He played the scheme as he was coached to play it. And I really, if you pick one guy you would like to see make that play and being recognized as a guy that made a play that won the game, you'd like to pick a Mike Jones because everything else he brought to the table. One yard short. St. Louis, the gateway to the West, is now the gateway to the best football team in the world.
Still to come on Top 10 One-Shot Wonders. What is he doing? The rise and fall of RoboSack. People fall in love with what he looks like as opposed to what he is. The number nine One-Shot Wonder of all time, Jim O'Brien. Set to go, snap, ball down, kick up, kick is on the way, and it is good! It's good! It's good! Adam Vinatieri is known for kicking game-winning field goals in the Super Bowl. And once again, kick is good! But Jim O'Brien did it first. Nine seconds, showing on the clock. In 1970, our number nine one-shot wonder was a rookie who specialized in rubbing the veterans the wrong way. Because he came in with long hair, a lot of the veterans used to call him a dope head. In those days, hippies and beatniks, you know, their karma was interfacing at the apex of their life, so their bio ruins, blah, blah, blah. He wasn't really like that, he just happened to have longer hair. Look at the hippie. Back then, kickers did more than just kick. O'Brien was actually better known coming out of college as a pass catcher. We drafted him as a receiver. He was an excellent receiver out of the University of Cincinnati. He was a football player. He wasn't a, uh, just a kicker. It's good that O'Brien could do other things because he wasn't a very good kicker, missing nearly as many as he made. The Super Bowl V kick was his only big claim to fame. Going into that game, he even hoped he wouldn't be needed on the Orange Bowl's state-of-the-art AstroTurf surface. He said to me, I hope they're not counting on me, Sunday. I said, why? He said, I can't kick on this stuff. He was a straight-ahead conventional kicker. He said, I take a divot, divot like a seven iron, and the way I kick, my foot's bouncing into the ball. I'm kicking the top half of the ball. Time goes back to throw again. Sets up, fires on the left side. We get into the game, United sits back for the touchdown. He misses the extra point, so uh, you can imagine what my feelings were the rest of the day about the game coming down to Jim O'Brien. With under two minutes to play, Mike Curtis's interception set up just that scenario. Our number nine wonder, the Beatnik, had a chance to win it. Second, showing on the clock. The Cowboys and the Colts all tied up at 13 to 13. Moral is kneeling. There is the snap. The kick is up and is long enough in. I think you got to give a lot of credit to that kid. He not only saved our Super Bowl rings, but he saved his locks that day because once we got inside, Billy Ray Smith said, boys, we can't do it. We can't cut the kid's hair off. We had planned on doing just that. It was going to be fun. So uh, we had a little ceremony and told Obi he had saved his hair. The number eight one-shot wonder of all time, Rob Johnson. Well, I think, you know, Rob Johnson was a guy who really got rich on one game. He had a great game for Jacksonville, parlayed it into a $25 million contract. In week one in 1997, Rob Johnson filled in for an injured Mark Brunel. Touchdown, Jacksonville! He passed for almost 300 yards, threw for two touchdowns, and ran for another. On the run to his left. He's going to have the first down pump action to the 20, the 15, the 10. Rob on his feet, five. Rob firing for the end zone. Touchdown, Jaguars! After Brunel returned, our number eight one-shot wonder went back to the bench. But that offseason, the Bills paid him $25 million to be their quarterback of the future. Truly, Rob was supposed to be the guy. He was the franchise player. They made a big investment in money. Wade Phillips identified him as his guy, his quarterback. Wade, the first-year coach in Buffalo with his quarterback, and felt they would be a duo for many years to come. Fires down the middle. And here's the thing, teams are desperate to come up with franchise type quarterbacks and when Rob Johnson flashed the little bit of talent that he had, everybody became enamored with the guy. Rob Johnson is, is the classic guy who people fall in love with what he looks like as opposed to what he is. 
he could draw him up on a board, this is what a quarterback would look like. So you look at all those things and you go, he's our guy. And then once you met him and you're around him, <laughs> you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't buy carpet from the guy. Set. Blue 28. Blue 28. Hook. Um, he wasn't the greatest team guy in terms of guys on the team liking him. He sort of separated himself some. I mean, these are men, and, and they're getting paid, and, you know, you're out here doing a job. And uh, my feeling is you got to take care of yourself first before you can worry about anything else. Rob seemed very uncomfortable with the idea of being the number one guy. And watching him in practice, you could see there was something lacking. He just didn't feel the game. He certainly didn't feel what was happening around him in the pocket. Knowing how to adjust. Pressure, sack. Knowing when to give up on a play. He would hold the ball, hold the ball, hold the ball. As a result, he took way too many sacks. Hung on way too long that time. You know, and then he was, when every time he got hit, I mean, something could break or shatter every time he did get hit. The man who became known as Robo Sack missed a lot of time due to injury, and this gave his backup an opportunity. And in comes Doug Flutie. He is the guy, he is the leader. Flutie, let it go for the touchdown! He's what the Bills need, and Rob Johnson isn't. He is a miracle man, man, yeah. I believe. Flutie became a local hero, and this caused a quarterback controversy when Phillips decided to start a now healthy Johnson in the 1999 Music City Miracle Game. He reaches it back to wide check. He throws it across the field to Dyson. He's got something. Even though he played well, it was another notch against our number eight one-shot wonder because the Bills lost, and the what-ifs lingered. everybody knows we had the game won with Rob you know in hindsight you know Doug Doug probably would have won the game so you know that's that's kind of way we look at it the controversy lasted another two years after that game in 2001 Flutie was cut one year after that Robo sack was let go as well Coming up on Top 10 One-Shot Wonders. One of the uglier dances I've ever seen. Whatever happened to the man behind the shuffle? Get your hot chocolates! Get your hot chocolate! Easy is a 100,000 mile... Through the years, a lot of running backs have conjured great seasons, then disappeared due to injury. Rashawn Salam leaps the right side of the Rashawn Salam blew into the Windy City with over 1,000 yards in 95. David Sims led the league in touchdowns in 78. And Don Woods had seven straight 100-yard games in 74. Galloping, deluding everybody in the secondary. But in each case, their bodies broke down and curbed promising careers. This tale played out again when another Woods shuffled into Cincinnati in 1988. The number seven one-shot wonder of all time, Icky Woods. Hello, welcome to the precinct. What would you like this evening? What do you recommend? Well, we have a popular steak of Siasin and a very delicious chicken Icky. Chicken Icky? Oh, but it's really good. Few running backs have made a name for themselves as quickly as Albert Icky Woods. As a rookie, he burst onto the NFL scene, leading the league with a 5.3 yards per carry average. When the Bengals came out of training camp that year, Bruce Coslett said, Woods is a very good player. He fits with what we want to do, and that was that stretch-style offense. And he said, Woods has read that beautifully from the first time we gave him the ball. Woods was a quick study, partly because his college, UNLV, had run a pro-style offense. Most of the things that they were running here was a lot of the things that I've already ran in college, so I kind of knew, you know, exactly what to do. What the team was doing fit him, what he was doing fit the team. Uh, it was a perfect match. Get it out of his own Number seven one-shot wonder changed his number halfway through the year from 31 to 30. And he racked up numbers, rushing for almost 1,300 yards and scoring 18 touchdowns. Osiasen gives the ball off to Icky. Touchdown! Touchdown! Icky Woods! He 
also added a new chapter to the history of end zone dances when teammate Ricky Dixon challenged him to come up with something unique. I was like, Rick, 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 check this out, bro. This is what I'm going to do when I score. I'm going to go one, two, three this way, one, two, three this way, one, two, three back this way, and I'm going to hop back three times and spike the ball. He's like, oh, Ick, man, that's going to be live. He's like, yeah, dog, yeah. You know what? When you mentioned Nicky Woods, I had to think who he was for a second. See, the Bengals guy who danced, yeah, he is. You know, I don't think people really remember much beyond the dance right now. I'm still having horror memories about that dance. It's one of the uglier dances I've ever seen. If you're gonna choreograph something, at least have it be good. I don't think Icky will ever be on Dancing with the Stars, put it that way. Regardless of what you thought of the dance, it caught on faster than the Macarena. The steps were in the paper, and even 80-year-old owner Paul Brown joined in the fun. I said, Icky, I note your dance. Personally, I don't think much of it, but my wife likes it. <laughs> And with that, I leaned over in my right foot and over in my left foot, moved a little bit. Lo and behold, they, they thought that was really funny. You know, he, he parlayed that into a few bucks for himself. My son, Icky, got the Cutlass Supreme SL because it has front wheel drive, FE3 suspension, and because tests proved that the new T-Bird LX just couldn't run the slalom as fast. That kid, he's got all the moves. had won the Super Bowl. It was McDonald's and Ford, as I recall, were going to be big endorsement deals for him, and the, the shuffle was going to be incorporated a little bit. Bengals didn't win that Super Bowl 23, and, uh, and those kind of evaporated on them. In week two of the 1989 season, his future began to evaporate as well. A torn ACL was the first in a string of injuries that shuffled him off the NFL stage. Oh, my, you hate to see that. It happens, you know, with... with Running backs like that, you just never really know how long the wheels will stay on. I mean, guys like that, they they are literally one-hit wonders. Get your hot chocolates! Get your hot chocolates! We got liquor in it, makes the game go by more funner. Come on! These days, our number seven one-shot wonder still wears a Bengals jersey, selling hot chocolate and autographs to raise money for his charity. Maybe five bucks. Everybody still requests me to do the shuffle. Hey, man, let me see the shuffle. And I, you know, I kind of look at them. Man, I'm, uh, I'm 40 now. I don't do the shuffle no more, dude. You know what I'm saying? I, I said, I'm, I'm barely walking, man. I said, I tell you what, I'll do a shuffle for you. And I, I give them one of these and one of these, and they mad at me. Cause I, <laughs> why, what's that, man? I said, that's the, that's the best shuffle I can give you, man. The number six one-shot wonder of all time, Percy Howard. Percy Howard, the immortal Percy Howard. I have no idea who that even is. Percy Howard. Uh, <laughs> Percy Howard. He's my mailman, right? Who is Percy Howard? Percy Howard is a truly remarkable story. Never caught a pass in a regular season NFL game, and yet he got into the Super Bowl against the Steelers in 1975 and caught a touchdown pass, and that was the only pass he caught in his NFL career. Well, Percy Howard was a, uh, was a basketball player. The Cowboys had had good success drafting guys who were college basketball players. So they brought him in, and they had two really good receivers playing ahead of him. They had Drew Pearson, and they had Golden Richards. So they didn't have to play this kid. They had the luxury of being able to develop him, but they thought there was a lot there to develop. Going into Super Bowl X, our number six one-shot wonder was a long shot to get into the game, let alone catch a pass. He hadn't had a reception all season. Percy Howard's big break only came because Golden Richards was knocked out of the game by Hall of Fame cornerback Mel Blunt. Mel Blunt really beat on Golden Richards, something unmerciful that day. Ah, oh, they're just trying to get each other's attention, I guess. And wound up knocking him out of the game with, uh, with cracked ribs. So, Percy Howard had a play now. Once in the game, Howard, of zero career catches and seemingly zero common sense, started trash-talking with Blunt. He and I got into a verbal confrontation out on the field. I felt that I could get open because I, I had a certain burst of speed. 
So he said, well, why don't you go tell Roger that you can get open on me? Whatever it was he said, Blunt was like laughing. And Howard wasn't. Sure enough, I went back and I told Roger that I could get open. The next play, Stahlback does throw the ball to Percy Howard. He catches it for a touchdown. Stahlback looking deep. And there was no more shocked person in the Orange Bowl than Mel Blunt. I came off pretty much slow, and then I burst into some, to some speed. And when I did, I got on him, and while he was spinning, I was going by him. And when the ball hit me in the end zone, I called the pass, and Mel came up, his eyes were as big as a clock. In the closing seconds of the game, our number six wonder nearly caught a second touchdown, which would have won the game when Starback launched a Hail Mary. If I had jumped maybe just a split second later, I would have gotten that pass. If I had pulled that one in, and Roger, every time I see Roger, he talk about it, and they called me Bird at the time, said, Bird, if you had gotten that one, you would have gone down it in for me, you know, something to that effect. And I always say, yeah, but, you know, that time side maybe just wasn't meant to be at that time. Still to come on Top 10 One-Shot Wonders. These are men. He was still a boy. A draft bus who got a second chance to shine. All right, that's time, Tommy. Go to work. Recapping our Top 10 One-Shot Wonders. Number 10, one tackle makes Mike Jones a household name. Forget about one good year, he had one big play. Number 9, the Super Bowl game-winning kick gets invented by a hippie. He nailed that one! Number 8, appearances were what they seemed with Rob Johnson. Truly, Rob was supposed to be the guy. Number 7, Hickey Woods shuffled to stardom last just one year. Man, I'm, uh, I'm 40 now. I don't do the shuffle no more, dude. And number six, a rookie schools a Hall of Famer on his one and only career catch. And Mel came up, his eyes were as big as a clock. <laughs> the number five one-shot wonder of all time, Tommy Maddox. I guess if you're talking about one-hit wonders, Tommy Maddox had one phenomenal year in Pittsburgh and a lot of years that I'm sure he'd rather forget. Until 2002, Tommy Maddox would have made our list of all-time NFL draft busts. Our number five one-shot wonder was a star at UCLA and drafted in the first round in 1991. I think what happened, and what ultimately proved to be his downfall, at least in his first incarnation, was the fact that he came out of school too early. Tommy Maddox was just too darn young. He came into the game inexperienced, sophomore out of college, games too big, too fast. These are men. He was still a boy. He looked like a kid that, that might be selling candy bars door to door. He was so small. Maddox was brought in to be the heir apparent to John Elway, but it became apparent that he couldn't cut it at the pro level. From the mid-90s on, he bounced around the league as a backup wherever Dan Reeves was coaching at the time. Dan Reeves drafted him in Denver. Dan Reeves brought him to New York. I believe Dan Reeves even brought him to Atlanta. Everywhere that Dan went, Tommy went. And when Dan's coaching career ended, then it was only natural to assume that Tommy's quarterback career had ended as well. And so he went into the insurance business. We went down and did a piece on him for NFL Films. The whole thing was done as his career was over and he was looking back. And you could kind of see in his answers and you could kind of see in his eyes when he talked about it, this real kind of sense of loss. I've had to swallow a lot of pride coming back. It was um, to the point where, you know, people would ask you, well, what are you doing now? And what are you, you know, and you're like, well, you know. Are you still selling insurance? Yeah. Is that what you're doing now? Yeah, still doing that. So how did that pro thing work? Is it weird? Yeah, it's a, it's a business. Yeah, you stop playing football and enter the business world just like everybody else. So. Like a year later, I pick up the paper and read this story. It says, Tommy Maddox back in the arena football league. Don't forget the New Jersey Gladiators or the Red Dogs, whatever they were up there. And the next thing you know, Tommy Maddox is in the XFL. Stewart to the pocket, looks, fires down the field, could be picked in. He has just had a horrible day today throwing the football. 
In Pittsburgh, the Steelers had given up on the Cordell Stewart project and decided to let the XFL MVP try and fill the void in 2002. Tommy Maddox gets his chance and showed all the talent that he had when he came out of UCLA as a first-round draft pick. Tommy Maddox throws it for the end zone. Touchdown, Pittsburgh! All right, touchdown, Tommy! Maddox threw for 3,000 yards and 20 touchdowns. In that year in Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh should have taken the black and the gold off because they weren't the Steelers that year. They became an aerial circus, and Tommy Maddox fit it. Maddox is back, he steps up, and here's the rainbow. Our number five one-shot wonder was named the NFL's Comeback Player of the Year and led Pittsburgh to the playoffs where they won a shootout against the rival Browns. Throws it for the goal line, it's caught, there's a touchdown for Pittsburgh! The year after, Maddox regressed, and the Steelers won just six games. In 04, Pittsburgh drafted Ben Roethlisberger to replace him, and Maddox watched from the sidelines when the Steelers won Super Bowl four. He now has a Super Bowl ring, but his memories of 2002 are probably more precious. Even though in the grand scheme of things it just amounts to one year, it was one year that Tommy Maddox really needed. I'm sure it would have haunted him his whole life to say, if only I had another opportunity, I wonder if I could have played. Well, now he knows. one-shot wonder of all time, Clint Longley. Thanksgiving Day 1974, big game as usual between the Redskins and the Cowboys. And Roger Staubach gets knocked out of the game early. Redskins are comfortably ahead. The Cowboys' backup quarterback at the time was a rookie named Clint Longley, who really hadn't played at all. The game and Dallas' destiny was in the hands of Clint Longley. Apparently, no one told this 22-year-old that he was supposed to be nervous. He just started throwing deep passes. And one after another after another. Our number four one-shot wonder led the Cowboys back into the game, throwing for 203 yards and two touchdowns in the final quarter and a half. Reporters next to me scrambling through their press books trying to say, who the heck is this guy? It, would, it just happened. It was just there. And it was like, it was, it was just tumbling down the hill and they couldn't stop it. Get out of the way. His long bomb to Drew Pearson won the game with under a minute to play. And after the game, one of the Cowboy linemen, Lay Nye, said in referring to how unprepared Clint Longley was, he said this victory is a triumph for the uncluttered mind. And forever he'll be remembered as the Cowboy on Thanksgiving Day that won that game and also punched out Roger Staubach. <laughs> Yes, Longley made news once more in training camp in 1976. The story as it goes in Dallas is that that game went to Clint Longley's head and gave him an inflated sense of who he was and what his role within the Cowboys organization should be. He said something about me one day and I told him don't, don't ever say anything about me to any of my teammates, say it to me in my face. A few days later, he did something to me. He hit me from behind and just completely, uh, I mean, that's exactly what happened. I mean, his story that I was facing even saying something to him was a lie. Uh, looking back on it, you don't have an explanation for something like that. It was uh, two men getting on each other's nerves and uh, it seems very unlikely, one of the most unlikely things to, that could have happened. Of course, he left immediately, ran, and I've never seen him since that day. To prevent Staubach from probably physically killing Clint Longley, the Cowboys cut him immediately, put him in a car, and sent him to the airport, and I'm not sure Clint Longley's been heard of since. The last thing that, that we heard, he was selling carpet remnants out of the back of a van in Marfa, Texas. Coming up... The 12th round pick turns into a Super Bowl MVP. You get one more, you can run for mail. It's better. Straight up. I'll vote for you, dog. On the next episode of NFL's Top 100. The Super Bowl has seen a lot of big interceptions. Fires it out there. Intercepted. Jack Scarlett. Touchdown, Raiders. Oh, 
often by unknowns like journeyman Jack Squirek, who had just two picks in his five-year career, but one of them was in Super Bowl 18. In Super Bowl 37, no-name safety Dexter Jackson's two interceptions won him the MVP and a big contract in free agency. But Jackson merely seemed like the second coming of our number three one-shot wonder. The number three one-shot wonder of all time, Larry Brown. Here's O'Donnell, big blitz, and he fires a pass, and it pulled in and intercepted at the 40. Larry Brown with a big interception. Way back in the early 90s, when the NFL draft had 12 rounds, the Cowboys took a flyer in the 12th on a quarterback named Larry Brown. Anybody that tells you that in the 12th round, scouting prevail uh, is misleading you. They had to take somebody in the 12th round, right? And it was like, you know what, let's just take somebody who's close so we don't have to pay for him to come in. This kid at TCU, Larry Brown, a cornerback, let's bring him in. At training camp, he got so discouraged, didn't feel like he was getting a chance because it was a 12th round pick, he walks out of camp. Brown eventually came back, but his life didn't get any easier. Mike Zimmer, our defensive back coach, yelled at Larry Brown more than any player I had ever seen. Our number three one-shot wonder persevered, and in Super Bowl 30 had his one big day in the sun. Here's O'Donnell, big blitz, and he fires a pass, and it pulled in and intercepted at the 40. Larry Brown with a big interception. That's how you play, Larry. That's how you play, baby. With confidence. His two key interceptions helped determine the outcome. In the flat, picked up by the Cowboys. Come on, Larry. Brown was named Super Bowl MVP, and that offseason got a huge payday from the Raiders in free agency. But he never lived up to the hype. If you take away Super Bowl 30, Larry Brown was a pedestrian type cornerback at best. But so were a lot of players who made big plays in the Super Bowl. And once you make those big plays on the big stage with the big headlines, all of a sudden your value goes through the roof. I think Larry Brown was a product of a great system and a great team. And on one shiny moment, he was a benefactor. Larry Brown's best friend for life has to be Deion Sanders. Because you weren't throwing at Deion. Let's see, on this one side of the field, we got Deion Sanders, who's probably the best single cover corner that's ever played in the National Football League. On the other corner, we got Larry Brown, who's a 12th round draft pick. Hmm, wonder where we're going to throw the ball. Well, they threw the ball Larry Brown all season. He's our number three one-shot wonder because Neil O'Donnell threw it right to him, twice. I know everybody was thrilled for him when he, when he got the MVP. Uh, but, uh, you know, that, that's, that's a miscommunication between the quarterback and the receiver. And the shame of it is O'Donnell threw it right to him. There was no receiver out there. You know, Larry just happens to be in the right place at the right time. Still to come. He's got to go over 200 yards. An instant star implodes. You're the greatest thing in the world. Everybody wants to give you all the goodies, including the cocaine. Without a doubt, the running back position has produced the most one-shot wonders. Skip to Foster through there very fast. Back in 82, Barry Foster set a single-season rushing record for the Steelers, but sputtered out due to injuries. Hand off to Gary Big Hole. Most would claim Orlandis Gary's success in 99 was more thanks to the Broncos' blocking scheme than individual talent. Gary in the free and on the move. And there is a similar theory that tries to explain why Timmy Smith became the greatest running back in the world for one day, and one day only. The number two one-shot wonder of all time, Timmy Smith. He came out of Texas Tech in 1987, and he spent most of the season backing up George Rogers. Didn't, didn't play much at all. He was drafted as a running back. He played on special teams. But that was it. That's all the guy was going to do. You know, he's just one of those guys. He's part of the cannon fodder. Let's go, Let's go, Timmy! 
Timmy Smith was the ultimate underdog story, a no-name backup who got his chance at stardom in the playoffs when the starter got hurt. Had a good NFC Championship game, and then all of a sudden in the Super Bowl, he's starting. But here's the thing. Joe Gibbs was worried how our number two one-shot wonder would handle the pressure of making his first start in the Super Bowl. So throughout the week, the Redskins pretended he would only see spot duty. Because they were afraid he'd get sick and wouldn't be able to play. He'd be out there throwing up instead of playing. So they didn't tell him. So he didn't have time to get nervous. The only player who was told was quarterback Doug Williams, who tried to get Smith mentally ready. I can remember telling him, I said, if you get in this game and you screw up, you fall myself, I'm kicking your ass. I said, because this is my first time in the Super Bowl. And he just laughed. He said, I hear your old man. And he'll start laughing. I said, I'm not bullshitting with you. I can get ass. And then he realized that I was serious. And he said, if I get a chance to play, I'll show you. Smith showed the whole world he could play. He'll hand off to Smith, the deep back, good hole, midfield, horse race to the 40, far side 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown, Washington Redskins. He just kept going and going and going. And it got to the point where it was almost funny, because it was just like, oh, there he goes again, another 14 yards. You're watching this. This is history in the making. Our number two one-shot wonder finished with two touchdowns and 204 rushing yards. He's got to go over 200 yards. Will be the single game rushing leader in Super Bowl history. That's got to do it. And Doug Williams won the MVP award, but Timmy Smith was a, a national sensation. A couple of days later, he's spinning a football on David Letterman's show. Well, congratulations, Timmy, on setting a new Super Bowl record. It's got a great future in front of you. Thank you very much. Okay. It was shortly after that that his agent demanded to be the highest paid running back in the league. And I said, wait a minute, <laughs> this guy's played in two games. And it was all downhill from there. Some guys can handle fame and celebrity that comes at them quickly, and some guys can't. And he just seemed to fall in that second category. It was just too much for him. You're the greatest thing in the world. Everybody wants to party with you. Everybody wants to give you all the goodies, including the cocaine. And the last we saw of Timmy Smith was he was cocaine dependent. He was dismal as the full-time starter in 1988 and was cut a year and a day after his record-breaking performance. While trying to make a comeback in 91, Smith denied any drug use. Yeah. There was rumors that I was supposed to have been on drugs, but i never been on drugs, and, you know, I just want to clear that up. There's also been other explanations for why Smith was a one-shot wonder. Tim Smith is a simple one for me. It's called the Hawks. That's the offensive line that blocked for the Washington Redskins. He had an incredible uh, game, but if you look at the footage, probably you and I could have ran through those holes. Those holes were huge. They weren't big. They were huge. You could have driven trucks through them. You know, he ran through a lot of legal problems. He actually was involved with a, a drug sale that went bad. He, he might be in prison right now. In fact, Smith is behind bars. Though he outran the Broncos in the Super Bowl, Denver police caught up with him recently. And he's serving a two and a half year sentence in Colorado for selling cocaine. He had the great Super Bowl, bingo, the air came out of the balloon, he was going, going, guy. Coming up on Top 10. He was a truly outstanding, a brilliant athlete. The man who could have been the greatest quarterback Bill Walsh ever coached. Recapping our Top 10 one-shot wonders, number 10, an NFL journeyman finds Super Bowl glory. Mike Jones tackled Dyson. Number 9, a long-haired rookie kicks the Colts to victory. Look at the hippie. Number eight, the Bills throw 25 million down the Johnson. He just didn't feel the game. Number seven, icky shuffling days are short-lived in Cincy. Number six, a Cowboys Lone Star catch comes in the Super Bowl. Look at me. Touchdown, Dallas. Thursday, Howard. Number five, a draft bust makes good the second time around. They became an aerial circus. And Tommy Maddox 
spit it. Number four, a Thanksgiving hero turns out to be a real turkey. He did something to me. He hit me from behind. Number three, Larry Brown gets lucky in the Super Bowl. That's how you play, Larry! That's how you play, baby! And number two, Timmy Smith's day of glory leads him to the lockup. But I've never been on drugs, and, you know, I just want to clear that up. The number one one-shot wonder of all time, Greg Cook. Greg Cook could very well have been remembered or noted as the greatest quarterback of all time. Bill Walsh is famous for molding legendary quarterbacks like Joe Montana and Steve Young. When Walsh was offensive coordinator of the Bengals in 1969, he mentored a passer with a potential to be better than all of them, Greg Cook. He was a truly outstanding, a brilliant athlete. Had a very quick delivery. He could move, he could avoid. Very similar to Terry Bradshaw. And he had a rifle arm. I mean, he could deliver that ball uh, on a dime. Perfect anticipation. Laces up over the outside foot, man. You're down the sideline score. Just ungodly. One man can transform a team, that man is Greg Cook. His presence is magical. He seems to inspire something in every player. Our number one one-shot wonder also inspired something in fans. He would have been the next Marlboro man, you know, I mean, he's a great looking guy. He would have been a billboard not only for the Cincinnati Bengals, but for the National Football League. He'd have been on the cover of every magazine in the country for years. He was going to play 15 years in the NFL. He was going to be set for life. But Cook's star plummeted to earth in Kansas City. Come on, put pressure on that quarterback! The Chiefs finally found a way to stop Greg Cook. They ruined his throwing arm. I tore my rotator cuff. And uh, uh, we didn't know it at that time because we didn't have the medical attention that, that you have today. Team doctors let him play, and with a torn muscle in his shoulder, he led the league in passing and won Rookie of the Year. But in doing so, Cook did even more damage, and the archaic surgery techniques of the early 70s could do little when they finally operated. He had to cut through muscles. They just basically laid his shoulder open. If there was the rehab programs and the types of microsurgeries that exist today, Greg Cook was off and running for a great career. By comparison, Saints quarterback Drew Brees had surgery on his rotator cuff following the 05 season and returned to Pro Bowl form in 2006. Cook tried for several seasons to make a comeback, but was never the same player. Since retiring, he's tried to downplay the tragedy that lies in his injury. But those he's remained close to, like Trumpy, know the real story. Regardless of what Greg has told you, it's affected him psychologically for a long time, as well it should. He got cheated, and it's a scar he carries with him to this day. I mean, just think about it, whatever your profession, an accomplished heart surgeon out of medical school and you're saving lives for a year and you have a bad accident and take your hands away from you. You can never do it again. I don't know, I don't know how, uh, how people deal with that. I don't know what he would have done if he had played 10 or 12 years. I think my fingers would have been filled with Super Bowl rings. Now a painter, Cook himself sees little use in constantly asking what if even though his football career could have been his true masterpiece. I never looked at me as being a, a victim. And I try to, if I can, you know, avoid that trap, what, what could have been. It's not a healthy way of thinking. I had some success, and I, and I, I thank God for that. Greg Cook tries to look on the bright side, and perhaps that's all that one-shot wonders can do. The curtain may have fallen on their NFL careers, but at least they had a chance to shine on one of the grandest stages, if only for one act.